Hello, David. It's Robert here. Hello. Good morning. Good Hello, morning. Robert. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you, David. I can't be too long today, so we'll have to sort of um, uh, uh, be a little bit quick, uh, if that's all right, as I have to go somewhere. Um, no, that's perfectly all right. So, um, half an I, hour, I really. Another, I have another Zoom meeting at 10, but I, um, um, whatever time you can spare is, is appreciated. That's good. Well, I appreciate you spending the time. Half an hour, then. So, um, let's get to the chapter. It's chapter 7, isn't it, on the Holy Spirit? Yes. Would you like to read that section, section 4 of chapter 7, please? And then we can... Certainly. Uh, yeah. So, um... Holy Spirit, God's active force. Just as we use our hands to do work, Jehovah uses his Holy Spirit. The Bible reveals that Holy Spirit is not a person, but the force God uses to get things done. Read Luke 11.13 and Acts 2.17. Then discuss these questions. God will pour out his Holy Spirit on those who ask for it. So do you think Holy Spirit is a person, or is it God's active force? Why do you say that? Jehovah uses his Holy Spirit to accomplish amazing things. Read Psalm 36, uh, 33, 6 and 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Then discuss this question. What are some ways in which Jehovah has used his Holy Spirit? Thank you. Um, now, the first thing that struck me about this is it's kind of vague because it doesn't define what an active force is and it doesn't define what a person is. I went to JW.org and I looked up the insight in the scripture book and it's even that's a little bit vague, your sort of encyclopedia. I think I know, I mean perhaps I'm barking up the wrong tree, I think I know what you're driving at. I think you're saying that the Holy Spirit is impersonal. Yes. Whereas I think you're saying um, to the Trinitarians, and uh, you know my background is in the Trinitarian faith, although I don't attend church since 2010. Um, right. They would see the Holy Spirit as personal, possessing the four aspects of personality, self-cognizance, self-will, intellect and emotion. Is, is that the difference between the two and is that the definition? Um, yes, that is, that, that is, is uh, a, a difference. Right. Um, if you want me to, to research the aspect of the Holy Spirit in terms of um, those that have the, the viewpoint that it, it is a, a person, I'm, I'm happy to do that the next time. Well, I thought we were going to do that today. That's why we're reading the section on the Holy Spirit. Right, OK. Um, I would see the Holy Spirit as possessing the four aspects of personality, self-cognizance, which is basically the ability to say me or I. It's, it's when you speak and you recognize your own existence through the use of the pro pronoun I. If I were to say to you, I do not exist, that's a self-contradictory statement, because when I say I, I prove I do exist through the use of the pronoun I. So it's called self-cognizance. You you self-cognate, you, you recognise your own existence. Right, OK. <clears throat> um, that is not a, that, that's not a, a point of view that I don't, think I've, I don't think I've ever come across that point of view. But um, again, I, I'm, I'm willing to do some research on yes. that. Um, yes. Uh, uh, let me just... I mean, for instance, David, um, in, in your literature, you liken the Holy Spirit to, ele to electricity, and I forget which um, Watchtower article said the Holy Spirit was like electricity, but I do remember reading that. And I've also read that you liken the Holy Spirit to the wind. Yes, the script, I think the scriptures do use that um, uh, illustrative term. I mean, like in Acts 2, with the Holy Spirit coming upon the 120 in the upper room, it, um, it, it it speaks, let me get that scripture. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it says, suddenly there was a noise from heaven. Uh, which which verse are you reading? No, let, let's, it needs to be, everything needs to be referenced so I can scribble it down on my pad of paper and reference it. Sure. Which, which verse are you looking at? Uh, Acts 2-2. Two, two. Yep. Okay. 
And uh, in um, our latest translation, New World Translation, uh, Study Edition 2013 of the Bible, we read, Suddenly there was a noise from heaven, just like that of a, of a rushing stiff breeze, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and tongues as if of fire became visible to them, and were distributed, and one came to rest on each one of them, and they all became filled with Holy Spirit and started to speak in different languages, just as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Mm-hmm. So, uh, just looking at our reference notes. So, there. what's your point? <laughs> well, the, it, it's, it likens the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is linked with a rushing stiff breeze. Well, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit is a, a, um, a wind right. or a, you know, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit is the wind. It's, it's just, um, it's, it's just likening this miraculous event and just describing this miraculous event and how it actually happened. Um, the fact that they were filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 4 doesn't prove that the Holy Spirit cannot be a person because you see I would see in the Bible the Holy Spirit possessing the four aspects of personality self-cognizance self-will intellect and emotion um, we can be filled with all the fullness of God in Ephesians 319 and the right. um, it doesn't say the text doesn't say all the fullness that God's God gives it's all the fullness of God um, if you go to the kingdom into linear translation to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God Ephesians 3:19 I'm reading from the New King James version but your kingdom into linear says the same thing so a reference to God the Father we can be filled with the fullness of God the Father and in the next chapter Ephesians 4:10 uh, we can be filled with all the fullness of Christ. He who descended is also the one who ascended, so that obviously is Jesus, far above all the heavens, that he, that's Jesus, might fill all things. And when it says all things, it's not talking about teapots or uh, cups and saucers and uh, kettles. It, it's talking about God's people. So we're filled with all the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 4.10, and we're filled with all the fullness of the Father in Ephesians 3.19. And, you know, I have read in your literature that you believe the Father is a spirit and he's a person. You believe Jesus rose as a spirit creature. I might disagree with that, but you, you say he rose as a spirit creature. So he's a spirit and he's a person. The angels, the demons and Satan himself, they're all individual spirits and they're all individual persons. But then you say the Holy Spirit is a spirit and he's not a person. It does seem a little inconsistent with, with respect, David. Uh, don't I don't obviously I don't quite see that and um, see see what because I've said actually I've said too much really I said several things you you don't see no what? Uh, the the Holy Spirit being a person your line of reasoning um, I, well I've actually been very I, careful in what I've said I actually said the Holy Spirit is personal. Because if I say person, you might think I think he's like a, a human being sitting on a sofa. I have seen in Christian literature God the Father and uh, the Son of God pictured as two um, men sitting on a sofa and then there's a dove flying beside them. Uh, it, it, he is portrayed that way in um, some chick tracks that I once saw and I think that that's wrong. So when I say I would prefer to say the Holy Spirit possesses the four aspects of personality in the Bible. He, in the Bible, he has self-cognizance, he speaks and says, I, he has self-will, he has intellect, he has emotion. Now, if the Holy Spirit possesses those four aspects of personality, then it doesn't really matter what label you stick on him, whether you call him a, an active force or a person or, you know, you could say he's a la, 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 la. It doesn't matter. The word doesn't matter. The fact is that whatever word you use to refer to the Holy Spirit, like us, and like the angels, um, and like the Father, um, he would possess personality because he can self-cognate, he has self-will, he has intellect, he has emotion. So the scriptures that uh, in our Enjoy Life Forever book, the, the, the four scriptures there that give um, um, uh, 
meaning to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, how do they not persuade you that it's an it's an active force? They're, they're rather completely than irrelevant. Sorry, I sorry I cut you off. I do beg your pardon. Sorry. That's right. Um, They, they don't um, help you with the understanding that um, the active force, sorry, that the, the Holy Spirit is an active force. I, I can't quite grasp this idea of, of a power having personality. Well, you believe the Father is... Well, the, 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 I think we have to start from the Bible and see what the Bible says. Those four scriptures aren't really relevant because they don't even attempt to define what a person is or what an active force is. You, you're kind of sort of labeling, you're sort of trying to prove your point by labeling. You're saying um, the Holy Spirit is an active force. So therefore, because we've said the Holy Spirit is an active force, he is an active force. That That's not proof that's not evidence i think you have to go to the bible and i mean for instance the first scripture that's quoted is the giving of the holy spirit in luke eleven thirteen. is that right i don't have your i can get your enjoy life yeah, forever up on my 11, phone yeah yeah luke eleven thirteen. if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There is absolutely no way that that scripture in any way defines what an active force is or what a person is, nor does that scripture in any way define who or what the Holy Spirit is. You, you cannot in any way from that verse or from the other three verses determine who or what the Holy Spirit is. The fact that the Holy Spirit is given proves absolutely nothing. Uh, yes, the Father gives the Holy Spirit. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Luke eleven thirteen. But in John three sixteen, the Father gives the Son. So if the Father giving means that, that what the Father gives cannot be a person, then Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cannot be a person. Because He's also given by the Father in John three sixteen. So the the issue is you have to define your terms what is an active force and oh. what is a person and then only then can you understand the difference between them and your right. literature does seem to be incredibly vague and non-pacific because it just does not define terms have you um uh, if i could encourage you to access the book reasoning from the scriptures uh, if i may read um under the heading spirit this the, the reasoning book which page is, number which page number page 380 380 okay it's going to be a brief quote is it okay well if, if you well if, if you just bear with me and maybe um uh, well get your response for perhaps we could develop this next time um it says what is holy spirit a comparison of bible texts that refer to the holy spirit shows it is spoken of as filling people. They can be baptized with it, they can be anointed with it. None of these expressions would be appropriate if the Holy Spirit were a person. Could I just stop you there? Could, could I just sure. stop you there? But we've proven that people are, that, that the Holy Spirit is given, right? Um, what is the word? Is it give? What's the word in Luke eleven thirteen? Um... Give. give. Right. Spirit, so the Holy Spirit is given in, in Luke eleven thirteen. If that proves that you can't give a person, right, because you can only give an active force, then Jesus is not a person in John three sixteen because he's given. Then you uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't wouldn't go along that with that because it's it, 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 the, the, the situation is 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 different. Um just very simplistically, just the same as um a husband might give a wife money for new, more clothing, or the husband might give flowers as, as an expression of love. Mm. I, I don't, I don't see the differentiation there. Um, you, you, uh, you can't build a doctrine on something so vague. Also, I think your book that you just read on page three eighty talks about being filled. You can't be filled with a person. 
But I've shown right. you from Ephesians 3.19 that we are filled with the fullness of God, meaning God the Father. And in Ephesians 1.23 and in, and in Ephesians 4.10, we are filled with the fullness of Christ. So if you can't be filled with a person, then God the Father is not a person because we're filled with the fullness of God in Ephesians 3.19. And Christ can't be a person. Ephesians 4.10, Ephesians 1.23. The next thing that the book said was baptized. You can't be baptized with a person. Um, but people were baptized unto Moses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, it talks about a rock that followed Israel in the wilderness. And it says that rock was Christ. Uh, I'll read from 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. I, I actually think all of this is a distraction because you have to define your terms to have a conversation. If you, if, starting from the negative and saying the Holy Spirit can't be a person because, 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 is irrelevant because you haven't defined what a person is. You haven't defined what an active force is. You need to define your terms first. But 1 Corinthians... I thought we had to define what the Holy Spirit is. Um, have you... Do you see there in the definition of spirit the uh, six points that are made? Can I can I just read one Corinthians ten, one and sure. one and uh, two? Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. Now, it says they were baptized unto Moses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. So if you can't be baptized unto a person, then Moses must be an active force. And in Romans 6, 3, people are baptized into Jesus Christ. Um, yes. I'll read from 6, 1. Romans 6, right. verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death so there's you, you know and, and 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 also the term poured out I think it's uh, Acts 2 17 talks about the Holy Spirit being poured out but Jesus Christ is poured out in Psalm 22 yeah. 14 and Paul is poured out in Philippians 2.17 and 2 Timothy 4.6 because poured out means giving yourself for service. It's a sort of um, expression. It's, it's, it's a way of talking that um, represents your giving yourself just as um, a drink offering was voluntary given in the temple. So you're giving yourself for service. But you, you can't start with the negative. This is how some... Um, groups like the Mormons and the Christadelphians and the Way International and Scientology works. They don't define their terms. They start with a negative. They'll say, well, you know, um, Jesus can't be so and so and so and so, or God can't be so and so and so and so, because, 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 because. And they have a long list. And what they're saying is not positive, it's negative. Now, what you need to do is to start from the positive. You need to define what an active force is and what a person is. Otherwise, otherwise, we cannot even talk. We cannot even have a conversation because when you use the word active force, I don't know what you're talking about. The Holy Spirit. I understand. But what is the difference between an active force and, a, and, a, and, 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 and personal? Now, I think, but please, I'll let you finish your quotes, but I think we need to, after we, you've read your quotes, we need to look at the fact that in the Bible, the Holy Spirit has self-cognizance. He speaks and says, I and me. In Acts 13, 2, which the wind can't do, the wind can't say I and me, nor can electricity. The Holy Spirit has self-will when he forbids Paul preaching in Asia in Acts 16, 6. The Holy Spirit has intellect. There's several scriptures for this, but one of them, is Romans 8.27, which talks about the Holy Spirit having the mind of Christ. And go to your kingdom into linear translation, and the word mind is used. And finally, the Holy Spirit has emotion. He can love, Romans 15.30. He can be grieved, Isaiah 63.10. So it's best to define what you're talking about at the start of any conversation. And then once you understand what you're talking about, then you go to the Bible and you examine is this biblical? Is this correct? But if you don't define your terms carefully 
And if you just start trading Bible verses, like schoolboys trading punches in a playground fight, we're going to go nowhere because I, I don't know what you're talking about and you won't know what I'm talking about. Uh, sorry for such a long digression, but please continue with your quote. I think it was um, 380 you were reading from. Um, so uh, we have a definition there um, from the Hebrew and the Greek. And the, uh, our little reasoning book says that um, these Greek words are often translated as spirit, have a number of meanings. All of them refer to that which is invisible to human sight, which is which gives evidence of a force in motion. And then you've got uh, wind, active life force in earthly creatures. Three, the impelling force that issues from a person's figurative heart that causes him to say and do things in a certain way. Four, inspired utterances um, originating with an invisible source. Five, spirit persons, and six, God's active force, or Holy Spirit. Then we have an explanation of Holy Spirit. Um, and in the second paragraph, um, our textbook says, Jesus also refers to the Holy Spirit as a helper. And he said that this helper would teach, bear witness, speak, and hear. It is not unusual for the scriptures in the scriptures for something to be personified for example wisdom is said to have children in luke 7 35 sin and death are spoken of as being kings in romans 5 14 and 21. while some texts say that the spirit spoke other passages make clear that this was done through angels or humans and we have a, a number of scriptural references there um, in 1 John 5, 6-8, not only the Spirit, but also the water and the blood are said to bear witness. So none of the expressions found in these texts in themselves prove that the Holy Spirit is a person. But what is a person? That's the issue. What is a person? And what is an active force? And your, your, book, is not, your, your, your book is not actually even attempting to define that. It, it's, it's working from the negative. It's saying, you know, people who are not in our little group are wrong. And it's giving negative arguments. But it, it, I, I mean, I heard you read that spirit. I think I heard that spirit means that you are neuter. Did, did I read? Did you read that or something like that? Did you all what? Sorry. Um, spirit is neuter. So if you're a spirit, you're an active force because spirit is neuter. Is, is that what you... Is that what I heard you read, or...? Well, one of the definitions of spirit is the active life force, but then also the, uh, God's active force, or Holy Spirit. Right, well, I can't make head or, head or tail of that. You... Sorry, I, I can't make head or tail of that. Um, I'm a bit stumped, then. I'm not too sure where we go with this, then. Well, I, mean, I mean, what is an active force? And what is the person? Could you define those two terms and then the difference between them? Well, an active force, in simple terms, one could liken to a power. But a, a person obviously has a power. But there is um, personality and besides activity with, with a person. Um, I mean, the scriptures speak of the person of Jehovah. So it's some someone, something with, uh, as I say, personality, with purpose, with activity, that can interact. Well, um, what is personality? Sorry? If the difference between an active force and a person is that a person has personality, what is personality? Well, it's linked with qualities, isn't it? I mean... With regard to Jehovah God, in, in Exodus 6, it defines the numerous qualities of Jehovah. Um, John's inspired in John 4, 8, to say God is love. Right, so, okay, okay, we've got something there. God is love, yes? Right. Um, where is that verse again? I've... Uh, 1 John 4, 8. I 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Now... The Holy Spirit loves God's people. Romans 15, 30 talks of the love of the Spirit. 
that he has for God's people. So, if love is an aspect of personality, which you've just said, and if the Holy Spirit can love, wouldn't that mean the Holy Spirit is personal? One of the four aspects of personality, self-cognizance, the Holy Spirit can speak and say, I, in Acts 13.2, he has self-will, he forbids Paul preaching in Asia, in Acts 16.6, he has intellect, he has a mind, Romans 8.27, and the Greek word, uh, pleroma, I think it is, is mind, in the kingdom in Julianea. And here, emotion is the fourth aspect of personality. Romans 15.30, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. The love of the Spirit. So the Spirit loves. Now, how could the Holy Spirit be an active force if he loves? Because you've just said, persons love. Making a note of that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'd have to research that. Uh, yes, sure. That sure. Could, could, could I go through these four points, which to me distinguish what is personal from impersonal? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I don't think you can start with the word spirit being a neuter word, because if you try and argue from that that the word spirit is neuter, therefore the Holy Spirit is neuter and doesn't have a personality. What do you mean by that, my neuter? Neuter. I've never heard that before. Um, well, in, in, in um, the Greek language, apparently, and in other languages, words are either masculine, or they're feminine, oh, I... or they're neuter. Yeah. So, for instance, in French, if you sit on a chair, I think a chair is female. Right. Right. But you can't reason, you can't, uh, you can't reason that chairs are therefore persons because they are, use the feminine pronoun. Right. Right. In, in, in French. And I, I don't speak French, but that's what I remember uh, from my French, French lessons at, at school. Uh, chairs are feminine. Um, now, spirit is neuter in Greek. But if you're going to reason from that then God the Father would be neuter, because we read in John 4.24 that God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's a reference to God the Father. So if God the Father is, a, is, is spirit, and if spirit is neuter, you can't reason that therefore um, what that would make God the Father an, an active force, not a person, wouldn't it? All right. Um, now, the four aspects of personality are self-cognizance, self-will, intellect, and emotion. Um, this is what psychologists say is the difference between a person and something that is impersonal. Something that's impersonal would be electricity, or a rock, or a stone, or I'm, I'm sitting on my bed, so my bed would be impersonal. Okay? Just, or the just, wind. Just, just uh, give me, I'm, I'm making notes here, so... Yes. Self-cognizance. Yes, it means you, four you, aspects of personality. Self-cognizance. Self-will. Self-will. Intellect yeah. and emotion. And I'll go through all four briefly. The first one, self-cognizance, it means you cognate, you recognize your own existence when you use the pronoun I or me or mine. In Acts 13.2, we read, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now the text doesn't say God the Father spoke, spoke to them through the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit said, and he speaks saying me and I. So the Holy Spirit has self-cognizance. When he says I and me, he recognizes his own existence. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, something that is impersonal, like the wind or electricity, cannot self-cognate. -cog -cog the wind is not recognizing its own existence. Electricity doesn't recognize its own existence. Um, the second point is self-will. And thank you for your patience, by the way, with me, David. In Acts 16, 6 and 7, now when they had gone through Figuria and the region of Galicia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Misria, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Right. Um, so, the Holy Spirit forbade them to preach the word in Asia. 
And the point I'm making there is he possesses self-will, which is another aspect of personality. Something that the wind or electricity um, does not possess. We can direct electricity ourselves because we are persons, but electricity can't direct itself. The wind can't direct itself. Um, the wow. third point is intellect, and there's several for these, but possibly the best is Romans 8.27, which talks about the spirit having a mind. Now, you need to go to the kingdom into linear translation because it uses the word for mind, which I think is pleroma. I actually, I can't actually remember what the word is, but it uses the word mind. Now, every interlinear that I've looked at uses mind. Your kingdom interlinear translation, the purple one, uses minding. I don't know why. Um, or is it the blue one? Perhaps I've got confused. Um, hang on. Um, it uses the mind of the spirit. Um, now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And pluroma, minding, it's translated as minding, but um, bear in mind, I don't believe there are any scholars who worked on the New World Translation, but people with PhDs just translate that word as mind. Um, well, I can assure you that some of the most eminent of scholars who worked on our Bibles and secular authorities have um, acknowledged. And, could you, um, could you our, give the references? Sorry, could you please give their names and qualifications? No, we don't do that. But, uh, for instance... Well, um, then how can the I check it out? ...has received acknowledgement for its accuracy and won awards, but that's another subject. Uh, which uh, awards? Which awards has it won? I, I, I'm not going to bother to look that up, but okay. I, 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 know that, I know that that is the case. But we don't go in for that sort of thing uh, as an organisation. That's why you, you won't see any of the articles or the literature um, you know, have names against, against it. Um, but um, we are privileged to have some very eminent um, individuals um, could, could you name these it, eminent in, individuals? Who are they? Could you name sorry? them to me? Could you name these no, eminent individuals? No. And if, if I knew, I wouldn't, because that's, that, that's not um, part of how Jehovah's Organization on Earth works. Well, then how can I check to see that this is a reputable, good, honest translation if I don't know if, if everyone rena remains anonymous. They could be remaining anonymous because they have absolutely no qualifications at all. Well, uh, you just have to take my word for it, Robert, if that's, if that's not the case. And, and it's by our study, by our referencing to other translations, um, uh, you can go into jw.org and uh, ascertain with regards to uh, the ancient manuscripts that are referred to. Um, you can see the sources for the New World Translation, um, but in terms of any individual um, putting a name to uh, our articles and to the, to the Bible, you won't find that. It's a committee. Mm -hmm. um. I, I do know that when the New World Translation, the Greek scriptures, were published in 1950, you had a translation committee of five men, of which Frederick W. Franz was the head translator. Brother, Brother Franz has, um, yes, it is very common knowledge. Brother Franz is a lover of scripture and a deep understanding of, uh, of scripture. But uh, Brother Franz died some years ago. Yes, he died in the early 1990s, age, age 99. Um, but he, he only did one year at the University of Cincinnati, so he never got a, any degree in biblical studies. Um, and he, was, um, he went to Scotland to defend a Jehovah's Witness at a trial called the Douglas Walsh trial in 1954. Um, some Jehovah's Witness was put on trial. And Mr. Franz went to defend him in court. 
Uh, this is called the Douglas Walsh trial, 1954. I've got the court transcript, the whole hundreds and hundreds of pages of the entire court transcript. Um, on page 7, section B, Mr. Franz claimed to speak seven languages, including Greek and Hebrew. However, later on, um, the prosecution barrister asked Mr. Franz to translate Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, um, um, from the English into the Hebrew. And um, Mr. Franz, on page 102F and 103A, admitted that he couldn't possibly do that. So Genesis 2.4, apparently, I'm not a Greek scholar, it's quite a simple first year Hebrew translation. It's quite a simple translation to translate it from the English into the Hebrew. And Mr. Franz, who didn't have any uh, biblical qualifications, but was the head translator at the time of the New World Translation, um, he, perjured him, he perjured himself under oath, claiming to speak Greek and Hebrew, but when tested, he, he admitted he couldn't speak any Hebrew at all. I couldn't possibly comment on that. Right. And it's some time from that incident to uh, um, further work that Brother Franz has done. But, um, well, okay, okay, the final aspect of personality is, is um, emotion. And we read of the love of the Spirit in Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So the Holy Spirit loves us. The Holy Spirit loves God's people. Now, you said, 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. God loves. And that means that God is personal because persons love. Well, here the Holy Spirit in Romans 15.30 loves God's people. So this alone surely proves the Holy Spirit is personal, not impersonal. And I'm, I'm happy to use the word personal rather than a person. If you don't like the word person, I've no problem with the word personal. All I'm trying to prove is that surely the Holy Spirit possesses the four aspects of self-cognizance. He can speak and say, I and me, in Acts 13.2. He has self-will in Acts 16.6, 6, when the Holy Spirit forbids Paul preaching in Asia. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Well, you've never heard of electricity or the wind or a rock or a stone having a mind. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 27, the Greek word for mind is used in the Greek text. And every English translation that I've looked at, except for the New World Translation, uh, tr translates from the Greek accurately as the mind of the Spirit in Romans 8.27. And here in Romans 10.30, the Holy Spirit loves God's people. Wouldn't that mean that the Holy Spirit possesses, David, the four aspects of personality? Self-will, uh, self-cognizance, intellect and emotion. As a... Um Without researching um, that, I could see that from the standpoint of the Holy Spirit emanating from Jehovah God. Well, yes, I do believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So, so yes, I, I, I would agree the Holy Spirit emanates from the Father and, and also from the Son. There is a bit of dispute in Trinitarian theology. The Western Church says there's a dual procession of the Holy Spirit. The Eastern said, Church says there's a single procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father through the Son. I would probably actually probably lean towards the, the Eastern Church, but um, I'm no expert. I'm no biblical scholar. Um, it was called the Filioque Clause. And it was, um, it was a sort of big issue about a thousand years ago. But that aside, I would agree with you the Holy Spirit does proceed from the Father and the Son. But the issue is, don't you believe the Holy Spirit possesses self-will, self-cognizance, intellect and emotion? If he does, then he cannot be like the wind or electricity, can he, David? So, uh, but is your point of view stemming from... Uh, a belief in, in the Trinity. It's stemming from a belief in the Bible, that the Bible says the Holy Spirit speaks and says, I and me, in, in Acts 13.2, he possesses self-cognizance there. 
In Acts 16.6, the Holy Spirit possesses self-will when he forbids Paul to preach in Asia. The Holy Spirit has a mind, Romans 8.27, which, to make it a little bit confusing, would be the same mind as the Father and the Son, the Son and his deity, um, because there's one God and he has one mind and one will. Um, so the Holy Spirit has a mind, Romans 8.27. Well, have you ever heard of the wind or electricity or a rock or a stone having a mind? And the Holy Spirit can love. He has emotion. He can, he can love us in Romans 15.30. He can be grieved in Isaiah 63.10. You can insult the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 10.29. How can you insult an active force? How can you insult the wind? How can you insult electricity, David? And you can also you can also blaspheme the Holy Spirit. This would be the last yeah. section on on emotion. Um, Mark three twenty nine talks about certain people blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So if you can, if the Holy Spirit can love, and you can grieve the Holy Spirit, you can insult the Holy Spirit, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. How can you blaspheme or insult the wind? You can only blaspheme or insult. A person, or if you don't like the word person, someone who is personal. Someone rather than something, because you can't blaspheme or insult or grieve something. I'm going to have to go. It's an emergency number. Sorry, I have to go. Bye. Okay.